This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Tuesday, May the 30th in the year 2006 in the large meeting room B of the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea and I'm speaking with Mr. Russell Zapel. And uh, Mr. Zapel was born on March the 21st, 1925, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project. And I'm wondering, um, yesterday was Memorial Day. Right. So maybe a lot of memories are a little bit more current than they right. might otherwise be. Um, but anyway, Mr. Zapel, um, let me begin by asking you, when did you enter the service? I entered the service in, um, in May, May 14th of 1943. And what were you, where were you living at that time? I was living in Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. And I, uh, after I graduated from high school in February of 1943, um, well, I worked for a short time for Simpson Electric, but then when I reached my 18th birthday in March, uh, I went over to the draft board and rather than wait to be drafted, I, I volunteered as a selective volunteer. And uh, because I was told that if you were a selective volunteer, you could quote unquote pick your service, which wasn't quite true, but it worked out. My father, had, being a World War I veteran, had told me, do not go in the Army, do not go in the Marines, go in the Navy, you've always got a clean sheet and a pillow to sleep on. So I followed his advice. <laughs> now sometimes um, the vets who choose the Navy, they, or they don't choose the Navy, it seems to be related to whether they can swim or not. Is, is, no, that didn't that bother me. didn't bother you. I swam, so it made no difference. <laughs> Wouldn't have made any difference anyway. <laughs> so uh, what area of Chicago did you live in? I lived in Austin. Oh, yeah, what side? The Austin area. You know. Yeah. And did you go to Austin High School? I went or? to Austin High School. The Tigers, right? The Tigers? Yeah. Well, you know it, huh? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I graduated in the February class. So. So does that, did that mean, in effect, that you graduated in three and a half years? Or no. It was still four? Those days, you had two graduating classes, one in February and one in June, depending on when you started. You had a full four years. Wow. Um, now, you and your, uh, your friend at school, you must have been aware that there was a war going on. Yes, we were all very much aware of it. Yeah. And we all went in about the same time because they were all that age. So did any of your, other, any of your friends uh, choose your strategy of trying to volunteer for one, the, as selective? No, they went in as, as draftees, but one of them ended up in the Navy, the other ended up in the Ninth Division in the Army over in Europe, which wasn't too good, but he survived. The, uh, it's just amazing to think of uh, being 16 or 17 years of age and knowing that uh, you know you're going to get your diploma in a short time and then you're you're going overseas. You're, well, that was wow. That was that was in every that was in every young person's mind from the day the war broke out. Uh, I don't think any of us believed it was going to be over by Christmas. Uh, you know. Uh, we knew it was going to last a long time, and my father, all of our fathers were veterans of World War I. We were involved with the Mellon Romer Legion Post because they sponsored a Boy Scout troop which had a drum and bugle corps and a drill team, and we were very much involved where, with... Uh, where, if I may ask, where was that uh, VFW? Uh, no, American uh, Legion. American Legion, where was that located? On uh, Division and Laramie Avenue in Austin. And it was a very, it was the Boy Scout troop was so large that they had to make two troops with one scoutmaster. It was, everybody came to it. Just, it was incredible. 
we were all well aware of what was happening, you know, because we were surrounded by World War I veterans. When you figure yeah. those days, they were, it was 20 years after they got yeah. out. You know, they were still very young. Did, um, so I don't know, like at the holidays that year, in December in the new year, did it, did it affect one's ability to enjoy the holidays knowing that... Uh, that didn't... Or you're just young and you don't even think of it? Or when the war broke out in 41? Yeah. Well, I was still a little bit too young. You, too knew, young. you knew you had a couple of years to go yet. Yeah. It didn't seem to affect anything. At and that last, that last holidays in uh, uh, the winter of 43 or whatever, that you were still able to No, because the, I was looking forward to graduation the next... You were looking to next, get next looking, month and a half down the oh, road. Right. Okay. So you handled it. Okay. So um, so you chose the Navy then. Is I that chose. I asked for the Navy. You asked for the Navy because they said we could pick your uh, uh, branch of service. But as I said earlier, that wasn't quite true because when you got down there, it was all all those in the Navy stand on this line, the Marines stand on that line, the Army stand on that line, which was a big lie. It was a, you hit, it was a lucky break that I got in the line for the Navy. Wow, almost one in three or something, huh? Yeah. It was. That was downtown it was, somewhere. It was downtown on Plymouth Court and Van Buren. Oh yeah. Where the induction center was. So, so there wasn't any like a, a test or an interview. It was just where you stood. Right. It all depended on where you stood, and you had to you had to kind of keep your eyes and ears open to see what was happening to these guys and hope that you picked the right line. Yeah. And I did. Yeah. So then from that day until they, did you go up to Great Lakes then? Yes, I did. So how long of a gap or a space there did you have between the going About, downtown? About uh, three days. Three days to get your affairs in order or whatever. Right. Yeah. Then we went back down to the same place. And then did you have any other brothers or sisters that were affected in the war? Or no, I had two sisters, younger two, than me. Two, yeah, younger. And your dad, he had been in World War One, and he had been in the Army, was No, it? he was in the Navy. He was in the Navy in World yes. War One. He was okay. in the North Sea Mine Force. North Sea Mine Force. That's where I got my good advice. <laughs> and then was there some kind of a World War II song, the Army gets the gravy, but the Navy gets the beans or something? Or? Some song. Well, like I suppose. Or like, the girls. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you get you have uh, three days, and then you're up at uh, at Great Lakes. Then that's right. right. We were sent to Great Lakes on the old North Shore Railroad. And how long were you up? Were you up there? We were up there until the first part of July for boot camp, and then we were sent home on a short leave. And then we were uh, had to go back to Great Lakes, and we were put aboard. And then we were sent back downtown again and put aboard a train, and we didn't know where we were going. I ended up in, in Norfolk, Virginia, you went at east. the Naval Operating Base. Yeah. Were there any interesting experiences at uh, Great Lakes? Did you have to learn how to sleep in a bunk or something? Or I had to learn how to sleep in a hammock how for a few nights because the Navy hadn't given up the hammocks yet. But then we got bunks later on. I I liked it. I was prepared for it. A lot of people didn't, but I I enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, as best you could. You know. um, so, does the Navy? Do they have drill instructors like in? in oh the yeah. Army? Are they kind of tough yeah, birds? Yeah, they they were they were uh, each company in the boot camp had chief petty officers, which was the equivalent to the drill sergeant in the army. Not, not as mean and nasty as you see in the movies, but they were, all of them that I knew of were World War I veterans that went back in and took this job and were given chief ratings. It was a little looser than the Army. Yeah. How was the food at that point? Not too bad. Great. Navy food is good. Navy food is good, yeah. So then you're, um, you're in boot camp, and then you're shipped via train to Norfolk. Via troop train. Yeah. To Norfolk, Virginia, on a uh, 
And uh, the troop train consisted of uh, converted boxcars with wooden benches in them. And we sat there for three or four days going through. This is August or something, was it? Or September? Yeah. yeah it's kind of warm, I bet. Yeah, it was. Not air conditioned. Well, you could open the big sliding doors on yeah. the side. <laughs> it was a slow trip because it was steam engines and you had to go through those West Virginia and Maryland mountains. We didn't know where we were going, we just knew we were going east. So when you get to Norfolk, what happens there? That's another big camp or naval base? It's a big, it's a big uh, collection center, and they decide what they're going to do with you. They put you in a fenced-in enclosure and decide what they're going to do with you. And for, for a few days, uh, we loaded supplies aboard a carrier that was in port, and then I was sent over Somebody was looking after me. I was sent over to the Naval Air Station at Norfolk, and I was assigned to a uh, to a Hedron outfit, which is Headquarters Squadron. And uh, one of the squadrons in that Headquarters Squadron happened to be VP-74, which is what I eventually ended up with. I, uh, Does VP stand for something? VP. V in the Navy means heavier than aircraft, and P means patrol. And and then they were changed to VPB, which means patrol bombing. Patrol bombing. And then it went back to VP again. And 74 is just a squadron number. And then the FAW on your Well, that's air. Fleet Air Wing. Fleet Air that, Wing. That covers, a, that covers many, many Hedron outfits. So when you were chosen for this, uh, somebody was looking out for you. Well, they weren't looking out for me. I just was in the right place. At the right time. <laughs> Did you take any tests or uh, aptitude tests? No, or I was just sent over there. Electrical background or high school courses, nothing. No, I was sent over there, and uh, we were assigned to the Hedron outfit, and you did, because we were just boots, and we were uh, uh, second class seamen. We swept out the hangers and and wash down the, uh, the oil and uh, uh, exhaust smudges on the sides of the fuselages and that kind of thing and until uh, you worked your way up. So those planes that you were cleaning, those were, air, those were Navy planes? Those were Navy. What were, were they on training missions or on patrol? No, they were on patrol. It was an operating squadron. So they had a range of a couple of hundred, three hundred Miles oh, or more? Yeah, way, way out there. So they're looking for German submarines or exactly. anything going on? Yeah, yeah. and escorting, uh, escort, escorting, uh, um, convoys? Or? Convoys. Yeah. Escorting convoys uh, as far as their range, and then they had to, you know, come back. So, so that then becomes your, your, um, unit for the rest of the war then? This? Yes. After a while, I managed to work myself, well, not at Norfolk. From Norfolk, the squadron was moved to uh, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, which is right at the Virginia-North Carolina border. Still kind of on the ocean? Or? Oh, on the ocean, yeah. yeah. It was on Albemarle Sound. And then we just operated there. The Navy moved the squadrons constantly. And that's where I worked my way into the uh, into the squadron and into the ordnance part of it. Ordnance, of course, is ammunition or artillery ammunition, or guns bombs, or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Cleaning guns mostly when you're first starting out. Yeah. I never did go to school. Uh, a lot of the guys did because they were from boot camp. They were sent to aviation ordnance school. So I just got the book and sat on my bunk at night and and pass my tests that way. So you're still at this time. You're uh, you're still enjoying the food. You're yep. Sleeping I enjoyed my well, life. Sleeping pretty well. Sleeping very well. Getting along well with your very well. The buddies, your friends, right. or whatever, playing cards used, or your whatever. I was used to camping and being out uh, away from home because of the Boy Scouts. So how long were you in the Boy Scouts? From, uh, from the time I was 12 until I was drafted. And I went back after I came home. And that Boy Scout training was, uh, it was fabulous. prepared you well for the Army. It was then. fabulous. Fabulous. You're the first veteran to speak of um, the scouting background. 
It's interesting. Yeah. That, uh, my friends, my best friends now are still scouts, and we get together. So those were friends that you made before the war, those yes. scouts? from the time I was yeah. 12. In, in, uh, in Austin. I still see them. Yeah, cool. Yeah. All right, so did you, um, did you have any trouble staying in touch with your family? You write a letter a week? No, or I wrote a letter every day. Every day. Never missed. My mother wrote, uh, my mother wrote about every third day. My dad wrote every week. Did you have to worry about uh, censoring in letters or what you could say or couldn't say? Or? Yeah, once we got, once we got uh, uh, assigned to a squadron and we left the states, then the letters were, my mother would say the letters were censored. So when do you leave? As to where we were is all Yeah, the location out. seems to be what they... So where, where did you... Uh, so when you leave the States, mainland, where do you, where do you go when and how we do you left, go? Uh, when we left Elizabeth City, we went to uh, uh, Cocosolo Naval Air Station in Panama. And we uh, flew patrol out of there. To protect the canal or something? The canal idea? and that part of the, the sea lanes. And, uh, so were you up in the plane, or you served? Yeah. What was that? Well, one? I was flying by that time. Yeah, I was a crew member. So at that time, you're you're and in the air. You're operating the guns, or well, I was in charge of the ordnance, and uh, your, your job basically as an ordnance man on a flight, in case of enemy action, was to make sure those guns were supplied with ammunition, or to take over one if needed and make sure the turrets worked because they were, like all things mechanical, subject to breakdown. So you were constantly, that's what you did. And, yeah, so and, you, and you loaded the depth job charges and the torpedoes, and you, when you landed, you took them down unless, unless you used them. So what kind of boats were those, or, or planes that they were flying? PBMs. That stands for? Patrol Bomber Martin. Patrol Bomber Martin. The nickname, well, the nickname, the name of it was Mariner. Mariner. Were they good planes? Very good. They were very big. When they when they got rid of the old Wright engine and put Pratt and Whitney's on, they became very dependable. Uh, they weren't too great on open sea landings if the water was rough because that aluminum, it wasn't much different than flying inside of a beer can. You know, it was pretty light stuff. You didn't want to slam it into things. Yeah. And was that a picture you had of a... Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, dumb question. This plane only lands on water. Is That's that right? right. Yeah. And the crew of that is probably... 13, 14 people. 13, 14. And your rank here, AOM, does that stand for Aviation Ordnance? Man. Aviation Ordnance Man, second class. So did, how long were you in the Panama region? We were in Panama um, by the time we got down our, down to Panama it was it was uh, boy the dates are it was uh, the end of 44 beginning of 45 we were there for about six months and uh, by that time, uh, by the time of March of um, 45, the, the German wolf pack problem in the Atlantic was pretty well under control, and, it, and they were thinning out squadrons, moving them around, because there was a lot of them out in the area. And we were moved over to the Galapagos Islands. Oh, yeah guarding the other side of the canal against Japanese submarines. I don't think there was a Japanese submarine anywhere near it, but that's what we were there for. And um, were you, you were all happy with that assignment? Mm -hmm. Yes, and how? It was better in Europe and it was better in the South Pacific. So you were, uh, so you would sleep on the Galapagos Islands then? With we st stayed stay there. there. That's an interesting area, I on think. On Baltra. B-A-L. particular air island that had the airfield. Baltra. Had an airfield. The Army was on one side with B-24s, and we were on the other side with the seaplane ramps. It was called Baltra. Baltra. 
So what would be the range of one of those? Uh, the actual range? Well, many times we were in the air for 14 hours. Wow. Just, just cruising back and forth, uh, watching, looking for radar contact, and radar was pretty primitive in those days. Was it boring? Yeah. Yeah, but they had bunks on them, and they had a galley on them you could eat. And uh, it was pretty boring, especially at night. If you were up at night, it was. Yeah. So uh, did you go out on patrol every day then? No, about every other day. Every other day. And that'd be for, that could be for 14 hours? It could be. It could be as short as 6 to 8. Yeah. Could be 14. Did you find that the time was slow to pass? Was it was it hard to pass the time, or the, it gets boring no. or routine? And you. No, you uh, could. Uh, you you had a you had a job. It sounds corny, but you had a job to do. You had yeah. a you had a you had a watch station. Yeah. And you could move around. You didn't fly that high that you had to wear anything special. You flew maybe eight thousand feet, something like that. Yeah. And if it was cloudy, you came down below them. And you stood in the waist hatches, or the bow of the airplane uh, opened up like a fan, and there was a big window there, and you could lay there and look out that. Or you could lay in the tunnel by the tail turret and look out there. There was a lot of things to do. Or you could walk up to the flight deck if you weren't on watch and did you ever watch the pilot. Did you ever have to go into like a... Uh oh, something's happening. Oh yes. Take your battle stations, whatever they oh, say. Yeah. A lot of contacts. Uh, the particular, the time I flew, the flights I were on, we sighted some subs. We never, we never dropped a charge on them because they were too far submerged by the time we got to them. You know, those, you'd, you'd sight them or you get the first indication at about 15 miles out with the radar, and by the time uh, you, you headed for it and started to make a run, he already knew you were coming unless you were above the clouds. And he was diving, and if he was too deep, you just didn't bother wasting your charges. How, how shallow would the sub have to be for your depth charge to take him out? They were set at 25 and 50 feet in the string that you dropped. And he had to be deeper than that. Of course, he had to be a lot deeper than that because the concussion would damage him. You very seldom, you wouldn't want to hit him with a depth charge particularly. You, it was concussion that destroyed him. Oh. And then how would he know that you were coming? Through a periscope? He'd or, see you. Or through radar? Or if he was, if it, well, it was quite often they were surface. They were recharging batteries those days. They had to be on a surface more than they were under. Why do you have to, to be on, a, on the surface to, to recharge? recharge your batteries? Why? Because the batteries go dead under, if you're underwater too long, you're run by battery. So you come up. They had, they had to come up. And, and then what do you do, turn a crank or something? They had, to, they had to turn the diesels on. Oh, and then the engine. And would... the engine recharged the batteries. And uh, they had to die fast. And they got away quite often. But uh, if you caught one on the surface, as I say, I was never involved in anything like this. I was involved on, we, uh, an, on an assist where they had already been depth charged to the surface and they were disabled. So you flew patrol around them until the surface craft could get there and take them and then sink the sub. But uh, Was that a German sub? A German sub. Yeah. The wolf packs were very heavy up until uh, the first part of 45. And um, we did a lot of uh, rescue of torpedoed merchant ships, a lot of rescue of uh, aircraft that were down. Would you ever c land in the water out in the ocean? Or? Yes, very, very nail biting. Yeah, I was gonna. I I'm just guessing. That's kind of very tricky. Or the pilot's got to be good. The waves and all the this waves. Stuff. Well, you know, he can land it, but whether the airplane's going to hold together is another thing. As I say, there weren't. There wasn't armor plating you were flying around in. Yeah, it was very tricky. So would he come down in the water to rescue a single person then, or? Uh, yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, I have some statistics here on, on just our squadron. The squadron uh, cited in the course of 1941, when they were formed until the end of the war in 45, they cited 29 subs. They managed to attack 16 of them. They destroyed five. They damaged two. They rescued 220 airmen and mariners via open sea landings. And they directed surface craft and dropped supplies to survivors of uh, other merchant disasters of torpedo freighters and troop ships and things like that. Did you ever lose a plane? To, to, to landings? Yeah, oh, yeah, at sea. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, to spot a life raft in the ocean is nearly impossible. We used to go out on drills and drop one of the or put one of the crew members in a in a one man raft and then go up and circle around and try to find them. Never did find them. The pilot knew where he was at. We could never spot him. With his flares and his flashing mirror, you can't spot him if the waves if you got waves. Yeah. It's very, very difficult. So the Atlantic and the Pacific were equally uh Yes. Treacherous or difficult? Yeah. We had one, we had one crew that went down because of engine trouble when we were on the Galapagos, between the Galapagos Islands and Ecuador. They were going over there for supplies to Ecuador. There was a big base over there, and that's only about 400 miles. He spent, they spent three days on a raft before they found them. They didn't know where they were. Had another bunch up around. Uh, off of uh, off of Newfoundland, that spent a week in a raft, darn near froze to death before they were spotted. And then they knew roughly where they were. Yeah. So um, so you're entitled to rest and R and R, a little rest and recreation when you're in the in service. You get I only it? had to leave when I was stationed in uh, Elizabeth City. So you would get to leave. The only there. time I came home. Only time you came home, and then uh, in the canal zone, you didn't. No, that no. was you were basically you were basically in a war zone. You yeah. weren't. You didn't come home. And then in the Galapagos, there you was, were, it was another war zone. That's more remote, right? I mean, it's going to. Oh, very remote. Yeah, but you still considered that a good posting. Oh. You can't beat it. There's only some places better, like Bermuda, but uh, <laughs> uh, where people are. But the Galapagos are completely deserted. Yeah, it was just us. I mean, people spend fortunes to nowadays to to go to the Galapagos. Yeah, my wife and I have been back once. Nothing has changed. Everything's the same. They've got yeah. the nice turtles or something, right? Big turtles. Yeah. So the um, so would you say you spent I suppose I sh um, where where did you spend the most time when you served was it in the canal zone or or in uh, Elizabeth City or Galapagos Galapagos was the main so was it from the Galapagos then that you that was your from we there were, you were we were in the Galapagos till the till VJ day until until we see VJ day was in August. Or September, we didn't get out of there until the end of October. So there were no thoughts of bringing you guys closer to Japan or move you to Hawaii or something? Or there, after VE Day, we spent VE Day on the Galapagos, and then we knew things were heating up in the Pacific, and there was an awful lot of new engine work being done and overhauls being done on our aircraft, and there was rumors going around that we were going to be transpacked over to the Japan area for the invasion. And it was probably true, but we, it was over before that happened. Thank goodness. 
So in October, you're still in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. But you don't, you're not released from the Army until, the, pardon me, the Navy, until following March. Well, in October, the squadron left the Galapagos and was replaced by another squadron, 210, I think. And we went back to the canal zone. And in the canal zone, we were there a month, two, a month and a half, and there was a three-plane detachment they set up to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And I was on one of those planes that went up to Guantanamo, which was um, where I spent the rest of my Navy life until March of 46 in Guantanamo. And was that a, a that was another not unpleasant place to be? Very. I would go back to Cuba in a minute. The people, the country is just fabulous. I would love to go back. It's hard now though, isn't it? With the My sister was there not too long ago. Oh. With the but politics. that's a special deal. She went out as an educator. Through Canada or? No, she went through the United States, but as an educator. But uh, I would love to go back. I've always told my wife that if it ever opens up, I'd go back in a minute. Yeah. It was nice. The people are nice. The country's nice. The and, base was nice. Yeah. <laughs> so those were warm areas that you were, right? Yes. Pretty warm. So, so you like, uh, yeah. so that agrees with me, agree yeah. with you. So no sickness, no reaction to shots or? I, uh, Got a sore arm. Yeah. You know when I first went in. Yeah. And I got boils on my leg from the. They say it was from the dye and the dungarees, but that that cleared up. That's Did all. you gain weight? Did you grow? I went in at about 175 pounds and six feet. I didn't grow, and I came out at 180 to five, and and it wasn't that much of a weight gain, but it was certainly better distributed. Yeah. When I by the time I got out down to 163 now. Yeah. So you, so they were, March 17th, 1946, then you're mustered out or whatever, released? Yes, I was sent back. From the Galapagos, we went back to Panama for a day or two, and they tried to get us to re-enlist, and we all said no, then they, uh, they put us on a, uh, uh, they put us on a plane to Miami, and we sat around in Miami for about a week, and they put us on a train back to Great Lakes, and I was discharged from Great Lakes. That was handy, yeah. In March. So you come home? I came home. I was, we, were, we were given our discharge, and, uh, and I forgot how much money. Did you have any? Three hundred dollars, I think, something like that. That seemed like a lot in those days, too. Oh, it was a fortune. Yeah. And they put us on the North Shore. And I came into the North Shore station on Wells and uh, Van Buren, and uh, took I took the L back home to Austin. Nobody knew I was coming. Boy, they must have been surprised when they saw yeah, you. Yeah, they were. <laughs> but they knew you were coming out, though, right? They knew they, I was getting discharged. They just didn't know the day. Yeah. So, did you have any difficulty? transitioning back into civilian life? No. Why? Why? Because I was glad to be home. You're glad to be home. I was tired of the Navy. I wanted to see my friends. They were already discharged. Uh, the government was very generous to us. You've heard of the 5220 Club. We got uh, $52 a week for 20 weeks. So we lived on that. Then I got a job at Simpson Electric. That's where you had worked before? No, or that was then, No, that's where I worked. Yeah, that's where I worked before. Then I got a, then I went back there for a few weeks and but in the Navy I developed a trick knee and I was home in June. My trick knee locked. And I it locked at a ninety degree angle and I was associated with Mellon Roma American Legion Post, and the service officer said, you come over and get me, we go out to Heinz Hospital, and he took me out to Heinz Hospital, and they looked at me and says, we've got to operate. So I spent from June to August at Heinz Hospital, because once you got back in the hospital, it was like being back in the Navy. You, they wouldn't let you out till you're 100%. That was in 46 then? It was in 46. So that kind of delayed your 
getting back in the swim. So then I, I, I got a car and I dilly dallied around. And then the University of Illinois Circle Campus opened up. And I went to school there for two years, but only got a year and a half credit because I didn't apply myself well enough. And then I came out and got a job with Automatic Electric. And I got clued in on a better job for Illinois Bell, and I worked with them for 41 years. Was that using the GI Bill at um, at, at University Univi? at Univi at yeah. down Navy Pier? Yeah. yeah. Nothing real exciting. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a trick knee sounds a little too exciting. Well, that was that was that was kind of a. You asked me if I had any trouble adapting. You know, I sometimes think about it. Maybe I did. I was glad to be back at Heinz. It was back to the old service routine again. Yes, yes. You, you had a, a hundred other guys around you with the same experience. You went to Chow at the same time. You went to movies. The USO came. Yeah, you didn't have much of the USO down in, or did you have USO uh, support down in, in, the Panama. in Panama? Yeah. They came, a small troop came to the Galapagos Islands, which we weren't too happy about because it was very casual. You didn't wear much clothing, and you had to get dressed. You had to get dressed in your dress whites when they were there, and nobody could. You know, they were down at the bottom of the sea bag and they had to be washed. <laughs> yeah. Did they, uh, could you get beer down in the Galapagos? Yes. Oh. 3.2 beer. And you get movies down there? Yes, we got movies. Yeah. About two movies a week. We're pretty good duty. And uh, if they didn't have what you wanted, you could walk to the other side of the island because the Army base had movies. So the Army and the Navy got along pretty well then? Very well. They came over to us. We went to them. So you, you um, did you join the uh, the um, VFW or the American Legion then? The, some of the veterans organizations when after you, the war. After yes. the war, mm -hmm. are you still a member? Do you yes, attend I am. meetings? Yeah, both of them. No, I still go praying with the VFW and the American Legion. That's in my blood from the Boy Scout troop yeah. and the ROTC. So you were in ROTC in yes, high school. Four years old. And was that Navy or Army, the ROTC? ROTC, those days was just Army. So even though you were an Army ROTC, you still went into the, it, the Navy. It did me well as far as military discipline went and uh, what you have to know in the military, you know, pretty good, pretty good stuff. But you never thought of making a career of the military? No. no. Often thought about it. Yeah. But then I wouldn't have been as happy as I am now, you know. Well, that's the main thing. I met the girl I, I love and... How did you, was, did you meet her through the service? Were you, no. You weren't wearing a uniform at the time? I met her on a blind date. Oh. Yeah, long after I got out of the long uniform. Time. So, um, as you look back on the, uh, your time in the service, was, how do you think it affected your life, being in the Army or the Navy? Did it, um, it sure improved it. Improved. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. It, the service, uh, you go in as a kid. You go in as a high school kid. You're right out of high school. You got a whole different attitude on life uh, within two, three years. Well, I was in three years. You got a whole different outlook on things by that time. Yeah. I think that was true with all GIs. My wife was going to Wright College at the end of the war. And when the war ended, all the vets came. And she still talks about how much better that school got when the vets came because there was no messing around. They were there for a reason. Without sounding too high and mighty, uh, they, right. we, we all had a purpose. Yeah. I can tell you a little more about the squadron. Uh, the squadron was formed in 1941. They were the first PBM squadron. PBMs were brand new. 
and they ranged their their range in the course of their uh, before they were disbanded ranged from Iceland at the very beginning to as far south as Rio de Janeiro and everything in between. And of course, when I was in it, we bounced all over too, but not, uh, like uh, Puerto Rico, Trinidad, but those were just uh, flights for different reasons. And the and the the mainstay was the patrol. The, our main purpose was anti-submarine and uh, convoy escort. And that was the war horse there, or the that's the PBM, right? There weren't any other. That did most of the work, or all the work. That, that did all the work in our squadron. And your squadron. There was about. There was a good eight PBM squadrons on the Atlantic coast. There were two or three PBY squadrons, if you remember the old Catalinas. That, yes, yes. That was the Catalina came before this. The Catalina came in 36, this came in 39. The Catalina was a, a few of those, and then there were PV squadrons, uh, PV1s, PV2s, which were land-based planes, they were like, a, like Lockheed Electras, a Lockheed uh, Venturas twin tail aircraft, small, uh, that did patrol. There was a lot of aircraft flying around all up and down the, the uh, East Coast and down to South America. Because the submarine activity down around Rio de Janeiro was immense. The Argentines were even flying PBMs and sinking them. They were in tr they, German submarines, there were a lot of them were lost along the, in the Atlantic. Now, you, be, because you volunteered as selective, did that mean you were in the service for a longer period of time? No, I was same length duration in six months. The only thing that meant was, quote unquote, they, uh, you could select your service, which wasn't quite true. Yeah. And then and you, you didn't have to wait for the draft. You knew when you were going to go. Which meant something. Um, the. Um, your special service awards and medals. You, that was now the American area that denoted your s service rendered from uh, the Elizabeth, Elizabeth City, the coastline of the United States. And, yeah, and uh, well, and uh, the whole American area is uh, is South, is North America, and South America. So that would include the canal and the West Coast and the West Coast. And then the victory. That's a victory medal that everyone. Everybody got that. Everybody got that because of a successful effort. The only other thing uh, it wasn't an award, it was a combat air crew wings. But anybody that uh, you flew as a combat air crew and got checked out, you got the wings, but otherwise you didn't, you didn't get them. And everybody didn't get an aerial gunner's badge. You had to go to a special school for that to become an aerial gunner. They wouldn't put anybody on a gun in the airplane because they'd be shooting the floats off or the tail or the propeller or something off. You know. I'm sorry, they'd be shooting the floats off? The floats. Oh, the floats. The wing floats. Well, that'd be a bad thing yeah, to do. You wouldn't want holes in <laughs> So what kind of guns are you firing? Machine guns? 50s. 50, 50 calibers. 50 calibers. And then, you, and then you had the depth charges on there? The depth charges were in the engine nacelles on each side. Each nacelle held eight depth charges. And the torpedoes were slung in the... Uh, in this part of the wing, between the engine and the fuselage, the torpedoes hung in there. Now, this this picture that you're referencing now, it, on the bottom, it says that was the name of the airplane, Putsi. 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 The first Putsi. This is Putsi two. The first Putsi was was uh, sunk by a submarine off of Rio de Janeiro. This is Putsi two, and the pilot of Putsi one. That's what his wife. That's what he called his wife, Bootsy. So that's how it got its name. And then this, uh, this was just uh, one in the air. There is it. The two of them in the air. This was our flight of the three-plane detachment that went to Cuba. The third plane is the one that's taken the picture. 
<laughs> and then uh, this, this was when we were in uh, Guantanamo, Cuba. We got a, an emergency call from the, uh, the USS Sargo, which was, a, which was a fleet submarine, that they had, a, uh, they had a sailor aboard with a ruptured appendix, and they had to get him out of there because they couldn't get back to base. And he was about, oh, they were about 500 miles out, and, we had a, and our plane went out after him. And this was an open sea landing, but you can see it was ideal conditions. The water was pretty smooth, so we had no problem. So we landed, and they went over with a rubber raft and picked them up and flew them back to Guantanamo and into, into the hospital, which was a major uh, hospital facility on Guantanamo. That was pretty exciting, because we didn't know what the sea conditions were going to be. I think any time that plane must have landed at sea was pretty exciting. <laughs> Or a land liberator. Well, then we used... Um, like me, yeah. We used uh, what they call a JATO-assisted takeoff to make sure we got off. And they were uh, big clip-on rocket rockets that you put out on each side of the airplane back in the waste hat. You, you, you clip them on, and the pilot would taxi and get himself, sure. get himself a running start, and then he hit the button on the JATO jet assisted takeoff that airplane would go up like a fighter Choo. we used it there to get up to get out does the navy still use this today no the last one was uh, uh, they got rid of the last one uh, during the uh, early stages of the vietnam war but it, it seems very useful to be able to land at sea they got rid of all their seaplanes wow there was a one there was one plane that came out after this built by Martin, and it was a P-5M. They called it the Marlin. It was an improved version of the PBM. But they got, they got rid of all seaplanes, even the ones that were catapulted off of the back of battle wagons. Talking about the Navy's decision to uh, discontinue all seaplanes. Nobody, nobody that was associated with the... Uh, with waterborne aircraft in the Navy thought it was a good idea to get rid of them because there's a lot more water in the world than there is land, except that, air, that aircraft became more dependable with the jet engine. But Russians have been very successful with seaplanes. They've built some wonderful seaplanes. The Japanese are extremely successful with flying boats. Uh, Lord knows what they're going to use them for in the future. They don't use them for uh, passenger service, so what's left? <laughs> Handy to get to islands, I suppose. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, if you know, uh, there's um, a little uh, seaplane outfit runs out of the Bahamas called uh, Bahama Airways. They fly the old Grum and Gooses, which was a two-engine flying boat, but much, much smaller. Jimmy Buffett owns one, flies it around. <laughs> so they're very reliable. Very reliable. You wouldn't put a jet engine on one of these, would you? No. Yes, they, they, they did develop. They Martin, did. Martin developed a jet flying boat, and they made, they made enough to outfit one squadron, and then the Navy abandoned all flying boat squadrons. It was a Beautiful, beautiful airplane. I guess uh, you know having aircraft carriers and, and bases around the world is uh, must be somebody's strategy. But, well, that's the strategy. You know. Yeah, but I, I like I like admiral the, strategy. I like the seaplane thing. <laughs> that's the admiral strategy. Yeah. The seagoing service aren't particularly fond of Navy Air Corps per se, waterborne stuff. And yeah. They tolerate the Navy Air Corps aboard a carrier because that's the carrier's duty. But the uh, regular surface Navy, yeah. they tolerate them as a as as a uh, annoying cousin or something. You know? Yeah. Now your your pilots, uh, your, the pilots of these boats, these flying boats. 
they were were they happy to be flying these boats, or were yes. they, or were they rather have been flying a Corsair? Or, well, or when they were younger, something? they all wanted to be flying in fighters, but once they got into them, they realized how lucky they were. Plus, they were, they were, I hate to say this, they were a step up from the other pilots, and I don't mean to detract from a carrier pilot, because that, that is a incredibly tricky situation. You know, it's a controlled crash is what it amounts to. But these guys had to be master mariners. They had to have a mariner's ticket to fly a flying boat because they were using the seaways. And, and that, They were the same as a captain of a ship. So they had a master certificate plus their pilot certificate. They were good guys. <laughs> I, I think you're all good guys. <laughs> well, Mr. Zafel, thanks for coming in and uh, uh, My pleasure. being so generous and responsive in this interview. And I, I, uh, you're the first veteran we've interviewed from the Navy's waterborne um, flight service. I know nothing about them, but uh, they must have been very important with the, with the submarine. Uh, very right. Yeah. They, uh, they, they, between the United States Navy and the British, Navy and the Argentine Navy flying the same type of aircraft, they would have had a hard time getting rid of the U-boats because surface craft can't get them that quick. The, uh, the, the German Navy activity, as you mentioned, south of the equator around the Argentine. Was very strong. Is that trying to disrupt trade between Britain yes. and South America? Is that the idea? Yes. Yeah. Very much so. And convoys that were coming out of South America hauling war goods, hauling uh, bauxite aluminum, which we needed aluminum like crazy. And then the British got them from the other direction, and the French got them. The free French were flying PBMs. The British were flying some PBMs, but they didn't like them. They liked their uh, their seaplane, which was called the, the uh, Sutherland Short. Uh, flying boat, which is almost the same thing, and they were getting them. That was a good boat too. It was a very good airplane. It was a it was a four engine airplane. Did it have more lift or something, or more capacity, or not no. necessarily? No. 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 Martin made uh, four engine flying boats. They were called the Mars. Have you ever heard the Mars? No. No. The uh, Pan American. Pan American Airways flew the Martin Mars as oh, passenger. I can see that picture in my mind. So, aircraft yeah. and then the, the big admirals and and generals in the Pacific used Martin Mars to get around. I, uh, you know Halsey, Nimitz, um, MacArthur. You know they got around island island and yet they dumped them. I don't understand. Yeah. The Mars are still flying. There's still, there's still two Mars in operation. The Canadian government's got them, and they, and they, they altered the hulls, made a, made a water scoop down there, and in forest fires, they fly low over oh, and mountain lakes. They scoop it up, and then they fly over the forest fire and let it go. Yeah. They're still flying them. Very trustworthy. I wonder with all these, um, it's a smaller and smaller world, but all these, uh, natural disasters and earthquakes and tsunamis. I wonder if these flying boats would be useful in those situations. Of course, you got helicopters too, I suppose. You got helicopters now yeah. that get in there and uh, airfields get cleared the first thing. You know, they, yeah. they clear airfields before they clear anything, just like they did in World War II. They, they had to get those airfields cleared. They got their place as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Well, they're going to have a place in, in, in the Niles <laughs> Veterans History Project collection, thanks but to you. But you yeah. should, uh, uh, if you possibly can, get a hold of some of the guy, a guy that was in the southern, in the South Pacific. Those guys saw a lot. Of, I, I can sit here and tell you stories because I know some of these people. The PBM was the first American aircraft to bomb Japan. They because when they got as far north as, as Tinian, 
and some and Saipan and those places, they had the range to go in there and bomb the naval bases along the southern shores of Japan. And it and I got this from a guy that was with squadrons out there. They didn't get fired back on for three days because the Japanese didn't know what it was. They because the Japanese had a flying boat that looked just like it. And they thought maybe the guys were dropping bombs by mistake. <laughs> So these, the, you had a, a, a greater PBR. range than a, than a bomber then, is that right? Well, you could, or you could take you off? could sneak up you could sneak because up. you could put those down in coves on islands and, and when they were, the most of the guys in the Pacific, or all of them in the Pacific, worked off of seaplane tenders. The seaplane tender would creep up on, on islands and get into a cove and then the squadron would come back and land in the coves and they would be serviced by the seaplane tender. Fuel, ammunition, the crew was taken aboard to take a shower. Big boat. Food. Yeah. It was a big, it was a big thing. They could lift these things right out of the water and put them on the deck and repair them. And the seaplane tenders were very active and they could sneak up within a few hundred miles of Japan and undetected. Fly in there and bomb the place. Fly back. They, I, uh, there's a great book out called The Fighting, The Fighting Mariner. Some, it was just re, just put out a couple of years ago. I can't remember the name. It seems to be the person who wrote it was Hoffman. Fighting Mariner. And it, they talk about uh, a lot of this stuff. And these were classified as the uh, flying fortress of the Navy because they were so heavily armed. You had, uh, you had two guns and a turret here. Those were machine guns? Yes. Uh -huh. A double 50 here, just like that. Yeah. You had a double 50 in the tail, so far the same as a B-17. You had a double 50 up here, but uh, just after the wing on the fuselage, up there, the dorsal. The only thing you didn't have was the belly turret. You had a 50 in the waist hatch here. You had a 50 on the other side. And you had a, a 50 that could be moved out of this hatch on this side, and another 50 on the hatch on the other side that if you had extra crewmen, could put it in the socket and put an ammunition belt to it. This that, right here. Is that a, and is that a gun there? No, no. that's a that's a uh, that's a, a radio antenna. Oh, on the star here. One on of the, the many the radio ship. antennas. They had yeah. radio antennas that ran from here to here and from here to here, and they had one that played out like a big fish line. That when you were way out there, they'd run this thing out 500 feet in order to send signals. So they called it the, well, you can see the dorsal turret here. Yeah. Uh, so they were considered the flying fortress of the Navy. The only thing, they, if they came up from underneath you, you were in trouble. But we weren't particularly worried about fighters. They were in the Pacific, but we were. But they were heavily armed. And that's how they kept the submarines under control. If they surfaced them, they just, fly circles around them, and anybody that stuck their head up, bing, bing. they start shooting. So they had a hard time getting to their deck guns and shooting back. Hardly anybody knows anything about a PBM. I, 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 tell, people, I tell people, they say, what'd you fly? I said, uh, flying boats, PB oh, you were in PBYs. Because everybody knows about a Catalina. Yeah. Nobody knows anything about a Mariner. But there were more Mariners than Catalinas. And the Catalinas were first. Yes. Then 1936. The, then the Mariners. But they only had a 30 caliber machine gun in the nose. Yeah. And then they put two 50s in a waist hatch. And the Mariner is succeeded by? A Marlin. A Marlin. Is Which it more? Almost the same. More armament or? No. Bigger, different engine? Or? Bigger radar. Oh. Uh, um, well, there's a step here. See the step? Yeah. This is one hull, then it steps up to another hull. Well, you had a, in order to take off, when you were taxiing, 
you were down. In order to take off, you had to get what they called up on the step. You had to break that suction. So the airplane went from maybe 60 miles an hour at the point of getting up on the step to about 120 to get to be able to take off as, as like a big speedboat. But the Marlin, they discovered that if they extended this step almost back to the tail, they could get up there that oh, yeah. quicker. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know why it took them so long to figure, figure that, that out. Because they went through a lot of seaplanes before they got to that point. Could have saved some gas and gas, but, uh, some gas or something. But you treated them like a, like a boat. You know, as I say, the pilots were mariners. And then when you come in for the, the landing in, in, at your base, how do you, you take, does it, do you dock next to a, a oh, jetty to or a pier? Or does a little boat or? No. Should I buy a pen? Please. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the land back here. And this is the seaplane ramp. It had a big ramp. And out here, you had a big round donut float here and here. And in that float, you had a you had a line that came up with a loop in it, and they ran back underwater to here. And uh, and they had a uh, what they called a mule or a tractor sitting here. Oh, yeah. And here. And uh, you would uh, taxi in. This is the tricky part. This was very close to this and the seawall. And the pilots had a taxi in, and they had to play with that throttle and the cutoff switch. They'd cut those engines off to try, and just before the propeller would stop turning, they'd hit the ignition and it'd kick in again. They hoped, because they were coming in this way. Nose first. Huh? Nose first. Nose first. Yeah. And it was the ordnance's job, my job, and any other ordnance This hatch on the other side, there was a snubbing post. You'd open up that hatch and put out the anchor rig, and there was a snubbing post. And you would have to lean over with this five-foot-long bar with a line on it and catch this loop and haul this line in. The line was about that big around. And you had to hang out with your feet sometimes. And, and you haul that line in and put it over the snubbing post. And once it was on the snubbing post, the pilot could see down through a little hole by his feet. And you'd holler, I can't remember what you're holler or, now. You're yeah. secure, sir, but yeah. he knew it. And, you know, because if you missed it, and, and you did miss him, because the wind would push yeah. it off, things like that, he'd have to get those engines going in order to swing that airplane around before he hit the ramp or the seawall and try it again. And he wasn't too happy. And he ranked <laughs> you. And when they weren't happy, things aren't too good. <laughs> so then the, the, the tractor or the mule then pulls you in? No. No? No, then you got a, then you got a, a, a hold of, of this. And then a beach crew would come out. You were, you were secured. The beach crew would come out with a line, and by that time, the tail would usually swing around. The beach crew would come out with another line, which was attached to a mule or a tractor here, and you'd hook it on to the, there was a, there was a, uh, a hook back there. You hooked the line on it. He would start pulling you in, and this tractor would swivel or would, would he would keep tension on this line so this airplane didn't go swiveling all over the place because he'd be pulling you in tail first. And this would keep your nose pointing out. And then when he got in this far and the uh, airplane straightened out, then the other members in the beach crew would take these big floats with a double wheel on there, like a double wheel, one for each side and one for the tail swim them out, because this is a big flotation tank, and then uh, part of one of the crew members inside would open this hatch and hook this on here, 
and the beach crew guys would stand on, on the tires with their weight, would swing it under the airplane so it would fit under like this, and the guy on top would slam the latch down and lock it in place, both same thing on both sides. And then with the tail wheel, they do the same thing. They hook the tail wheel on where the rope was, swing it under the very end of the airplane, and lock that latch. They were, then you were, once that was locked, and then you, they'd pull you up, and then this, this guy would let the slack go, and this guy would pull you, pull you up on the beach. So are you still in the plane at this point? Everybody's in the airplane. So how do you get on land then? When they pull the, pull the tail in? No, because your, your nose of the airplane is, 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 is headed out the wings, yeah. wings, tail. Yeah. The nose of the airplane is this way, and this line is out this way. They pull you in this way. And this guy would, would uh, keep your nose pointed so it wouldn't swing around. So do you have to get into a little boat then or something? Or? No, they pull you up on the ramp. They pull you up on the ramp. The and tail this, comes up on the ramp. The whole airplane does. Yeah. That's, that's, how they, that's how they get you up, by pulling on this rope that's hooked to the tail. You come up the ramp, and, and uh, this is all cement uh, uh, parking area, and the hangers are back here. They just pull you up and drag you around. Once you got up this far, then they would take a tractor and hook Un unhook this and hook you to the nose and start dragging you around the field so, like they do out of O'Hare. So when you hit, when you land, it's probably a half an hour before the plane is oh, easy. docked on land. Right? Easy. If there's more than one out there, you wait. Yeah. Because even Norfolk, which is a major base, and Cocosola, Panama is a major base, only had three or four ramps. Now, and so a half a dozen airplanes come in, you, you wait. And now how long, suppose the message comes in, oh, they spotted a wolf pack, or this probably isn't. Well, other aircraft are out. Other aircraft are out. But you got, it takes you a little while to get out there, too, then, right? Oh, it goes out very easy. Does it? Oh, yeah. You can take get out easier than you can come in. Yeah, because they, they get you up to the ramp facing this way and get those, get those wheels, these wheels, sitting right on the edge of the water. All the whole crew's aboard. And the pilot gets the engines going. He just taxis. He taxis out far enough so the beach crew can come out, unlatch that thing, and then the uh, these lines from this thing, if it's rough water, or extremely cold, uh, he they, the, the beach crew attaches lines to these and pulls them in for you. If it's warm water, they swim them back. They let you go. The pilot pilot just goes. So you can get out, it doesn't take you... Once they release those landing gear and the line, he just hits the throttle and you go. If the wind's the right direction, there's no messing around, you just go. So you could, get, you could be airborne in 15 minutes or something? Or... Oh, yeah. yeah. Real fast. Because okay. that's, that's the sea lane you take off from. Because you're taking off more like a plane, you're coming in more like a boat. <laughs> you... Oh, yeah. Yes, you gotta... Yeah. The boat. Unless yeah. you have to get out somewhere else, then you yeah. have to cruise around like a boat. Yeah. And uh, it, it's very critical they, uh, uh, around a Navy base like that because they constantly have to have a boat in the water just cruising around, checking for floating debris. Other ships aren't interfering yeah. in, in the lanes, yeah. warning anybody because you can't, you can't hit nothing. So if you went down to Norfolk today, which maybe you have. They're still there. I they're, do. They're still there. They're still there. We, our squadron has had reunions since 1946. The, the officers had it first. And then the officers, every year, the officers found out, say, guys, when we die off, pretty soon there's going to be two or three of us left. Let's let the crew in on this. So in about 19... Somewhere in the 50s, they said, well, we, they, they let us know that they, we were invited, so we all go. You go every year? Every year. Do you fly, drive down, or? I drive. Unless it's on the West Coast, then I fly. Oh, it's not always at uh, Norfolk. Oh, no. no. This year it's going to be in Richmond. We've been, we've been all up and down the West Coast. That's kind of out of the question now. The guys are getting too old. 
uh, mostly it's along the East Coast, Southern East Coast. Elizabeth City, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Richmond, Raleigh, that kind of stuff, because most of them settled there from these Atlantic squadrons. Most of the guys settled uh, on, uh, on the East Coast. Is that because they were originally from the East, primarily, or? Some of them, some of them just liked it. Yeah. That, you know that Virginia Tidewater country is very, have you ever been down there? No. Virginia Tidewater? No. It's a beautiful country. It really is. The is only it, thing is they it too warm? warm? <laughs> well, it gets warm. It doesn't get warm like Florida or yeah. Mississippi. Yeah. I have a daughter who lives in Mississippi. It, it's just incredibly hot. But no, Virginia is delightful. Then you get snow in the winter. Light snow, you know, it's gone in a couple of hours. Change of seasons. I, I like Virginia. North, yeah. North Carolina, the same way. So you'll be going to Richmond then this year? Richmond this year in September. September. It may be the last one. Maybe. We still have pilots alive that were pilots in the Navy in 1937 and 38. They were pilots already. And in order to be a pilot back those days, in order to even be considered for flight school, you had to have four years in the Navy, sea duty. That was the requirement, because they didn't like Air Force. <laughs> but they're still around. In fact, the one guy, the next time you look, <laughs> we're getting way off the subject here, the next time you look at the Hindenburg, Yes, yes. Picture the Hindenburg. See those lines coming yes, down? Yes, yes. You see those sailors running? Maybe, yeah. Well, you see little figures out there running. That's the guys on the, on the lines trying to hold it there? Yeah. One of them is, is one of our pilots. He's still alive. He lives in Daytona Beach, Florida. Wow. His name is Gannon. He wrote a book. Gannon. That'd be an Irish, that could be an Irish name, Gannon. He was, he was a seaman at the time, and he's got some great stories at Lakehurst. Boy, he says, I never ran so fast in my life. He says, <laughs> he said, the funniest part of it was when that thing exploded, they all tried to hang on to the bow lines until, until scents came to their heads and they dropped it and ran, and they really ran. Yeah. He said the heat was tremendous. Was he's still alive. Yeah. Barney, we call him. His name is uh, Bernard, and we call him Barney. Great guy. He, uh, he's, he's got two submarines to his credit. He stayed in the Navy, and he uh, became a, a, a captain. He's had a pilot. He was a pilot. Yeah. Had another guy, his name was Jap. He landed uh, off the coast of Nova of, um, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, in the old PBM ones, which were the first ones built by Martin. They had retractable floats and very underpowered engines, and they had a, uh, a sinking of a uh, of a uh, Norwegian freighter. It was sunk by a by a German submarine because we were up patrolling. Another story there. I can. It's, it's off the record. It's not official. Uh, this story is official. He, uh, they went up because they were stationed uh, uh, in um, uh, Iceland when this when the sinking came, and they went over and got them. And those guys were froze to death. But they, but they got them all off the rafts very quickly. He got them aboard the plane with a full crew, full armament. Even though they were flying just for neutral patrol, they were fully armed with depth charges. And he got them aboard that airplane. And he, and he was at one of our reunions when he talked about it. He says, with all that weight on there, that airplane just hunkered down into the water. And it was almost right up to the waist hatch where it was going to come in. And it was before JATO those days. And he said, the sea was a little rough. He says, we buttoned it up tight. <laughs> Come on, baby. And I pushed those throttles against the windshield of the airplane, and I prayed to God, and he got off. And he brought them back. 
and he made a career out of the Navy, became a, a, a vice admiral. What was his he died name? only a, about four or five years ago. What was his name? Jap. 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 J -A. Admiral Jap. Admiral Jap. Uh, the unofficial story was uh, Dick Schrader, who died maybe five years ago now. He lived in Byron, Ohio, and he owned an airport there. He got out of the Navy. He owned an airport in, right outside of Byron. He was flying patrol out of Iceland uh, for uh, British convoys, and they were uh, spotting submarines. Well, this one guy, this one submariner surfaced and shot at Dick. And that pissed him off. And he went in after him. The guy was, the, 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 uh, the submariner was surfaced. And Dick got mad. He went after him. And he thought, he thought, well, I'm going to get Clark, Clark marshaled now. And he dropped a string of depth charges at him and blew that submarine out of the water. Uh, a few of the uh, crew members survived. They know who they are because you know, the German Navy kept actual records. And uh, at the end of the war, in about uh, 60 sometime, he got a hold of them. El Capitan <laughs> from, from the German Navy invited him to the reunion. Wow. The guy couldn't make it, he was sick. Yeah. But they kept in contact, Dick Schrader kept in contact with him, they yeah. became friends. And, uh, but it's unofficial. The first German U-boat sunk by the United States Navy was in August of 1941. Unofficial. But tr truth. <laughs> People aren't finding any books. We got it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Zabel. Thank you.